My name is Sean Jensen. I am the pastor here. That just means I'm the lead servant. I get to serve y'all. And uh, listen, I do want to let you know, like, the church is already a blessing to Liz and I, my, my family and I. And uh, you all have just been blessing us so much through pastor appreciation, through your prayers, your gifts, your cookies. I gain 15 pounds every October. Um, red vines in the mail. Like, you guys are just, you guys are incredible. Coffee. Uh, I just want to say thank you guys so much. Like, you did not have to do any of that, um, but at the, you guys just bless us so much. So thank you so much for your love, for your concern, for your care, for your prayers. Um, it makes, honestly, it makes our family healthy. It's great to tell our kids that we go to a church that loves them and that they're celebrating them and that they're cheering them on. So it's good. It's good. So we are in a series that we are calling The Black Cloud, and we are in week two, and last week people got free, y'all. I was finding out in the lobby last week, people were like, I did not know that there was this black cloud in my life, and last week Jesus lifted that thing from my life. And, and so we've been in this series talking about this thing called The Black Cloud, and uh, we learned last week what that was. It's on YouTube. I don't have time to unpack it. However, we are going back in the same scripture that I used last week in Romans 8, written by Paul to the churches of Rome. He wrote this good news to us, and this is what it says. Remember Romans 8, 1, he says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus and we learned that is great news for anyone who makes mistakes we learned that whatever we did Jesus paid for it we learned that the sentence for our sin was death but Jesus hung on that cross so we would not die but we could live Uh, we did grace is getting what we don't deserve and Jesus are getting what we don't deserve and Jesus getting what he doesn't deserve and that was death on the cross and so we are excited about that but Romans 8 tells us so now There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That's all I'm going to read right now. I'm going to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help me deliver this just powerfully so you guys can feel encouraged today. So, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what you did today. Help me, please. Amen. (laughs) It worked last week. (laughs) So, he just helps me. And I I take time to just give him him praise and that. So, um. I got to talk to you about something. I don't know how vulnerable I want to be with you, but sometimes me and my wife, I don't know about you saints in here, uh, but sometimes me and my wife, we get into heated arguments of fellowship. Um, We start fighting and uh, we're yelling at each other. And a lot of times when we get angry and we go into an argument, what we do is we take a couple breaths, we brew some coffee, we sit down, we get the chocolate out, we cross our legs and we start talking about our feelings slowly and patiently. (laughs) False, right? Like... (laughs) Now, granted, hear me out. Our, we are getting better, and that is our goal. Of course, we want to get there. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but that is not what it's like most of the time. Let me tell you about the oatmeal incident. You know it was a good argument when you have named that argument, right? Like, the, ar- the, the incident of 1998, right? Like, this is one of those moments. Let me tell you about the oatmeal argument. Uh, there was blaming happening. There was uh, verbal, passionate yelling that was happening. Things were getting... Uh, lifted, things were getting jabby, and we were pulling out our best punches, and uh, uh, verbally, by the way, and, uh, and we were pulling those out, and it was kind of a heated moment, and in this moment, I decided that while she was uh, in the other side of the room, and I was in the kitchen, because my voice was elevated, I would start cleaning up the kitchen, because the girls wanted oatmeal that morning, and by oatmeal, I mean they wanted oatmeal, but after one bite, they decided that they wanted something else for breakfast, and so it was out on the kitchen counter, so uh, in this moment, we were elevated and heated, and so I put the bowl of oatmeal into the kitchen sink, except I wasn't really close to the kitchen sink. Okay, I aggressively put the oatmeal into the kitchen. I threw the oatmeal bowl (laughs) into the sink, and it went everywhere, all over the kitchen. It was all over the floor. It was all over the window, and uh, and at that moment, listen, I know we're laughing. I know in the moment, honestly, it is serious. We, I, I don't take it lightly. It is serious. It should never have happened. It was a moment where I was like, man, counseling does sound like a good idea, right? Like, and uh, in this moment, I remember after that happened that um, I cleaned it all up. I apologized to my wife. We kind of had a laugh after it, and we kind of came together. We prayed. We forgave. We know Jesus forgave us, and we kind of had this moment of just steps that we could take forward. And a few weeks later, right, I'm eating my breakfast at the island, and I look up, and as I look up, I realize I missed a whole chunk of oatmeal on the ceiling. <laughs> Y'all, it was on the ceiling. <laughs> you going to come back after this week? Like, I've been waiting for a church for a pastor to tell me he gets upset, right? Like, and I looked up, and I was like, oh, shoot. So it got hard, so I went to pull it down, right? And when I pulled it down, it pulled off the paint, and it pulled off the drywall paper. 
and uh, it just, yeah, right? Like three weeks later, uh, in, in that moment, to this day, y'all, it's been a long time, to this day, I look up still at these moments when I'm feeling great, and I see this hole. <laughs> like, you haven't fixed it yet? Stop judging me. <laughs> I'm taking care of y'all. Uh, there's a hole in the, the ceiling, and it just reminds me of what I did. Even though I'm forgiven, even though God's forgiven me, even though we've come a long way, I'm going to counseling, and we're handling things a lot better, I see that, and it reminds me of the oatmeal incident of 2000 and whatever. Like, it's right there every time. Like, so now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank God that Jesus does not hold that sin against me anymore. Thank God that he has forgiven me and I don't have to live in that anymore. Thank God that how I was is not who I am today and he doesn't compare me to my past. He shows me my future. Thank God there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I have to remind myself that because if I was honest with you, I wish the scripture said, so now, therefore there is now no consequences for those who are in Christ Jesus. I kind of wish that was in there too. Anybody else? <laughs> because my condemnation was gone, but the hole in the ceiling reminded me of the consequence of my family walking on eggshells sometimes or the, the destruction I might have done in someone's mind because I elevated my voice when I should have stayed calm. And I think every time I see that, even though there's no condemnation, I still have to live with the consequence. And uh, therefore, there is now no consequences for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, we all deal with consequences. Some of y'all, we had a great week. We got free. We realized God has forgiven us. There is now no condemnation, and we walked out on cloud nine. But if, I'm not, if we're not careful, even though what has, we have sinned and where we have fallen, God has forgiven us, right? But we are still walking through the consequences of those choices. And if we're not careful, the consequences will pull us back into condemnation. It is hard to live free from condemnation when you're walking in the consequences of your past sins. And it's easy for us to allow those consequences to get uh, blurry lined with, condemnation when there are two separate things. God has forgiven you. He has died for you. He has forgotten about it. He says, I've thrown away your sin as far as the east is from the west. It's gone. But the truth is, is the consequences of a really good way of pulling me back into that condemnation. It has a good way of forming that black cloud back around me. And, and we have consequences. Let's think about it. Some of us are living in consequences because of what we have done. Some of us are living in consequences because of what others have done. And that's when we have to learn to forgive, but that's not this message. Actually, the whole reason we're having this conversation about Jesus dying for us is because Adam and Eve, we have learned that God had a way and a plan for humankind, and they decided their way, and because of one sin, we inherit the sinful nature. Now we live in the consequences of sin. In a fallen world, things are falling apart. There's pain and destruction and hurt. And so we, as a world, we are not condemned in Christ, but we're living in a world that looks like it's condemned. Because there's violence and pain. So how do we survive in a freedom mentality of saying, I am no longer condemned, but if I'm looking around, I'm living in my consequences. It is hard to feel free when you're still living in the pain and the bondage of your consequences from what you did in the past. I don't think it's any different than this woman I'm going to introduce to you in Scripture. In this moment, this is actually when Jesus was walking the earth and people were hearing his teachings. This woman was caught in the act of her sin. She was literally caught. She was guilty. Everyone saw it. Everyone knew it. In this moment, there was a woman who was having an adulterous affair with a man. And at this time, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the law, the ones that Jesus always pushed against, who thought they were all better than anybody else, but they never talked about their oatmeal stories. You know what I'm saying? Everything looked good on the outside, but they didn't tell you about the oatmeal on the inside. But they judged you for your oatmeal incidents, but they never talked about their oatmeal incidents. Jesus did not like that because we all have level playing field. And so what they did is they found this woman in the act. They catch her in the act. They pull her out to the town square. Everyone sees her probably naked. And they look at Jesus and say, this woman has committed adultery. The law of Moses, which we introduced to you last week, it'd be good if you watch on YouTube, says to stone her. And not recreationally, y'all. This is like the real thing. Like picking up rocks. Like that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> no, no, rock stoning. Oh, okay. So they're going to stone her. They're going to kill her. And they look at Jesus and say, we should stone her. She was committed in the act. Because this is what church police do, by the way. This is what Pharisees and the religious teachers do, by the way. They, they never, ever lift a hand to help build people up in the act. They always look for people and shame them in their act. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Don't be a church police where you hide your sins because you sin differently and you pick out everybody else's. They grab her when they had all their own stuff they could have grabbed. And they bring her out. And they were trying to trap Jesus. And so Jesus was asked this question, 
The law says stone her. What do we do, Jesus? And Jesus knew they were trapping him because if he said, okay, yep, you got to stone her, he realized that his whole purpose was to not condemn the world but to save the world so he'd be a condemner, so he couldn't say yes. But he also couldn't say, no, don't stone her because if he did, then it looks like he's just allowing her to sin. So this is what he does say in John 8, starting in verse 7. He said, they kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. There it is, y'all. Like, that's where it came from? That's where it came from. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust, savage Jesus. (laughs) He's like, one-liner, just starts writing. We don't know what he writes. Don't try to figure it out. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, because they realized how much more they sinned than the youngest. Like, I'm old now, and I've done a lot of bad things. Until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with a woman. Then Jesus stood up again, and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. She thought she was going to die that day. And Jesus says, no, I don't condemn you. Go, sin no more. He extended grace to her. He extended love to her in this moment. And then he sends her on his way. Now, let's think about this, because Jesus does not condemn her, but she was pulled out into the public square, probably naked. Everyone in that town now knew her shortcomings. She wasn't condemned by Jesus, but the whole town knew the consequences that she just lived in. It may have tainted her relationships moving forward. Maybe she couldn't even find a date anymore. People despised her, were chatting about her, were gossiping, which really wasn't gossip because she was caught in the act. So even though Jesus says, don't worry, you're not condemned, a whole town can remind her, you did this. So now she has to figure out how to listen to Jesus' words and not let the consequences of everybody else's words pull her back into that place. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're in a place right now where the consequence is, you know what? I have a broken relationship because of what I did in the past. My marriage is on shaky ground and on eggshells because of how I responded to people in the past. Maybe you can't get a job because you have a record on your name and because of what you did. And that thing is haunting. You know God does not condemn you. But the consequence is it's really hard to get a job right now. And so it's eating at you a Alive. Maybe it's something else in your life. There's a relationship thing, or maybe it's a school thing, or maybe it's at your workplace, or maybe you know what? You just had to post those things, so Thanksgiving's gonna be really awkward this Thanksgiving. Because y'all have different beliefs. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that Jesus doesn't condemn her, but she still had to live with the consequences of her sin. So can I encourage you today? Because this has been my whole heart. I've been learning this myself. How can I feel freedom from condemnation when I'm still walking through the consequences? That's what I want to help you with from what we see in this scripture. I want to help you in your consequences because you're free. The black cloud is gone, but it's going to try forming still. And you're going to have every day to remind yourself that Jesus already paid for that, but your consequences are going to try to remind you that you're still living in it. And God can still use you. You're not damaged goods. He can still use you for his kingdom. The first thing you can do, though, when you're living in your consequences is this. You can learn from it. You can learn from it. Think about this. Now, there's a lot of people in here who may be the church police who were a little upset that I did not drive home what, what Jesus said at the end even more. Like, Sean, you kind of just blazed over that. This is the moment I bring it back. Jesus literally meets this woman, does not throw rocks at her, does not throw stones at her. He goes, where's your accusers? She goes, they're all gone. He goes, I don't condemn you either. Then what does he say? Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Now, we don't know if he actually meant don't ever sin ever again. Of course, Jesus doesn't want us to sin because it hurts us. It hurts our relationship with God. And, and so he's, he's saying don't go and sin. Or is he just saying, hey, listen, don't go and shack up with other people who are not your spouse. Whatever it was, here's the same thing that we need to understand. Jesus extends grace first. Jesus shows up and he extends grace. Grace comes in. You know what I've learned in this? The moment that the law came in, they said, Jesus, we caught her, stone her. The law gives you no space to make mistakes. The moment you do it, you are now condemned and it is over. But Jesus comes in, he says, I'm going to give you grace. Do you know what grace does? Grace gives us space. Now, that might not sit comfortable with some of you, especially me when I started learning about this. Because I'm like, hold on, be careful how you say that. Grace gives us space. What did Jesus do? He said, I'm going to give you space. I'm going to forgive you. And I'm going to give you space to learn from your shortcoming. 
Do you know what grace does? Grace helps you get back up so you can do it better tomorrow. Grace helps you get back up so you can speak differently to your wife tomorrow. Grace gets you back up so you don't have to go back to the same environment tomorrow. It doesn't condemn you where you are. It doesn't leave you. It doesn't shake you. And it doesn't take your nose and rub it into your mistake. It says, I'm giving you space. Now, hear me very clearly. I am not saying grace gives you space to sin. I am saying grace gives you space when you sin. Because we fall. And I have learned the best thing we can do. I'm teaching my kids this when they make a mistake. What can we do? Can you change it? Daddy, I can't change it. Can you do anything to help the person that you hurt? I can say I'm sorry. I mean, what else can you do? I can learn from it. What I love about grace is grace, we can't be like Christ without grace. We can't grow into everything God has for us without grace. Without grace, we're still condemned. We're still under the law. We're still getting stoned because we got caught in our mistake. But Jesus shows up and says, I'm going to give you this thing called grace. And it's going to give you the space that you need to continue to become everything God wants you to be. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the space. I needed a lot of space in my life, y'all. I needed some space in my life because I know who I was and I know what I did and I know how I hurt people. And yet God's still saying, I'm still using you. Y'all, this pastor needs some space. (laughs) You ever say that to people? Just give me some space. Jesus says, my grace gives you space so you can learn from what you have done. If you don't believe me, Romans says it this way. Paul says, the law of Moses was brought in, Romans 5.20, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, so that the sin might increase. But where sin increased, I love this, grace increased all the more. Be careful preaching this, Sean. I don't want people to think they can get sin heavy. Listen, the only way to overcome sin is through grace. If we never talk about grace, people are stuck in their sin. But the moment they learn about this grace, they will realize of a God who loves them and loves them in the middle of their sin and wants to clean them up, not just to set them free, but so he can say, go now and sin no more. We cannot go and sin no more if it doesn't start with grace. Grace comes in and he says, go on and sin no more. What does he say? He says, where law came in, it just made you sin conscience. It made you black cloud conscience. It just made you focus on all the bad that you have done, right? If I tell you don't think about purple elephants, what are you thinking about? Which are really really weird, by the way. But the truth is, is what we tell people, right? We, every week, or when we see them, I heard say this all the time, I heard a judge say this, like, I don't need to really remind them what they did. They're already hurting because of the choices they made. And a lot of times, your kids, they don't need you to remind them four times what they did wrong. They already feel terrible. Like, your husband knows. He knows what he said. He is, he's already putting himself in the doghouse. Like, he grabbed his blanket and his pillow, and he's like, I'll see you tomorrow, honey. (laughs) Like, now, yes, we talk about it and we mention it, but we become so sin conscious when we need to become savior conscious. We elevate sin more than we elevate Jesus. Scripture says that when sin elevated, grace elevated even more. And it looked like a person on the cross that says, this is where your sins went. It wasn't a cheap grace. I bet this woman changed her lifestyle when she realized that could have been her last moment on this earth. She was guilty and she knew she was. And Jesus said, Go and sin no more. That's not a cheap grace. That's a grace that changes you. That's a grace that says, I don't want to put Jesus back on the cross. That's a grace that says, I don't want to break his heart anymore. That's a grace that says, if he was good to forgive me then, I don't want to keep doing it today. Grace gives us space when we sin. This is good news for some people. They Maybe you were raised in church like, I don't know if I can even, I think this is heresy. I don't know if I can accept this. Well, if you can't accept it, then the only other option you have is your self-righteous works to make you right. So you can accept God's grace that he covers your sin even when you feel filthy. Or you can work really hard to overcome your sin yourself and be stuck forever. I know it's hard to accept, but he loves you that much. What do I do when I'm in the middle of my consequences? You learn from it. You learn from it. Let it fuel you. Let it teach you. Let it pull the thing. How did I talk to this person? 
How, what happened there? Well, what did I do? What environment did I put myself in? God gives us space to learn and listen, and he's walking alongside of you when you fall. His grace is to teach you so you can become everything. Listen, I heard someone say this. We are a church of progression. You don't have to be perfect to come here. We're all moving forward. We're all progressing. We're all following Jesus. We're all taking steps. Have you seen the disciples? Have you seen the 12 he chose? Every time he's like, no, Peter, James, stop. Y'all, I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about spiritual things. I'm not a ghost. I'm just walking on water. Stop screaming. <sighs> Storm stop. See, I'm Jesus, right? Like, they're just like, oh, okay, all right. I think, and then the next day, they're like, Jesus, I know you just fed 5,000, but how are you going to feed 4,000? But I just, <laughs> progression, right? But I want to say it this way. There's a caveat. I would say the only way that we can progress is because we've already been perfected. Jesus' grace makes us perfect. Perfection leads to progression. You can't progress if you're still in your sin. He had to clear you of your sin, and now you can move forward from it. Perfection from grace. Perfection from the Holy Spirit. Hear what I'm saying? I am not giving you life. Cool, I can go do whatever I want. That's not what I'm saying. But when you find yourself flat on your face, and Jesus extends a hand and says, I see you, I'm still here for you, that grace means something. That grace means something. The second thing we have to focus on are consequences. Focus on Jesus' affirmation, not the world's accusations. Focus on Jesus' affirmations, not the world's accusations. You know what I've learned? I have learned that um, Jesus does forgive, but the world doesn't forget. Anybody else? I have learned that Jesus is a forgiver, but the world's not a forgetter. And in this moment, even though we know that this woman was forgiven, I'm sure there's a lot of people who reminded her what happened. Remember? Remember that woman that was caught? Oh, you're talking to her? Did you remember what happened? Can I remind you? Jesus may have forgiven her, but the world doesn't forget. I mean, I've learned this about our world. The world, the world doesn't want to forget about anything. They want to cancel everything. Not only do they want to cancel you for your sin, they will look back in your archives. Back when you thought Jinko jeans were a good idea. <laughs> when we were all making terrible decisions. <laughs> Remember those things? Anyways. MC Hammer Pants, should I go back that far? <laughs> uh, other people, oh yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Generations together, all right. Right, when we didn't know anything, they'll look back all the way there, find a decision you made, and they will cancel you because they found something that you did way back in your past. That's the kind of world we live in. But can I remind you something? Jesus does cancel sin. He confronts sin. He does not let it slide under the rug. He does not hide from it. He takes care of it. Sin is a big deal. Our Savior had to die for it. He confronted it, right? He didn't lie, lie it under the rug. Jesus cancels our sin, but he does not cancel the sinner. He does not cancel the sinner. He cancels the sin. He does not cancel the sinner. Now, before we cheer, we have to understand, though, because we love that when it comes to us, but the cancel started in the church. Right now, people are being canceled in droves because they want to dress up in costumes and collect treats for their kids in a couple weeks. Cancel! Don't talk to me. If you talk to me, I'm going to be possessed. <laughs> and yet, you want to talk about people in your church behind their back. Tell me what real rich craft is. Canceled, right? You went there. You shopped there. Canceled. You said that. Canceled. You listened to that song. Canceled. You saw that movie. Canceled. Man, cancellation started in the church. And until we can address it in the church, then we can start addressing it in the world. Because Jesus did not put us on this earth to cancel everybody who thinks differently than us. Jesus put us on the world to say, listen, I was stuck in my sin just like you. And there is a God who sent his son Jesus to cancel my sin and he still loved me. So before you cancel everybody, just remember what he's canceled in your life. Walk alongside people. Give them grace 
that gives them space. Because listen, the person you are putting such restrictions on, they started coming to Christ two weeks ago. You've been at this for 20 years. And you expect them to be where you are. Well, I've been doing this 20 years. I read my Bible every morning. I did this. Let's go back 10 years. Where were you at then? Let's be careful, right, that we don't keep reminding people of their faults and cancel them. Jesus does not cancel the sin. He cancels, or he cancels sin. He does not cancel the sinner. So when we walk through our consequences, we have to be very careful that we don't become the person. Scripture tells us, I didn't have this because I don't know if this was too strong, but now I'm going to say it because why not? Revelation tells us about Satan. At the end of his life, he's going to be cast down, and this is what he calls him. Guess what they call Satan? They don't mention his name. They just call him this, the accuser of the brethren, which means we never look more like Satan than when we accuse. Let me take a drink right there. Let me take a drink real fast. So if you're really good at calling out people's sin, good job, Satan. You're doing really good. <laughs> I'm not saying that we don't gracefully walk with people. I'm not saying that we don't show scripture and what Jesus has paid for. I'm not saying we don't have tough talks. But if we're really good at never addressing the stuff in our own heart and we're always accusing everybody else and where they've been, you're never more like Satan than when you're accusing everybody. That's what the church police were doing. But Jesus doesn't accuse us, he affirms us. What does that mean? Colossians 1.22. Paul's writing to the church of Coloss. He reminds them the same thing that I'm reminding you. He says, but now he, talking about God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body, he's talking about on the cross, through death to present you and I holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Y'all, let me just say that one more time because this should make you happy. Now he has reconciled, oh, go back. I haven't memorized it. I should. (laughs) But now (laughs) he has, and no one look backwards. You don't know what I'm cheating. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Go ahead and leave that on there. This is what's happening in this moment. Paul is reminding them, even if you've sinned, even if you're going through consequences, I just want to remind you that what God did for you is you were separated from him, and because of Jesus, you have been now brought back into relationship. I talked about this last week, how God wants you in his presence, right? And so he's inviting you in, but look at how much more, because of what Jesus did, because his blood was shed, and it was perfect for us. It says this, you are now holy in his sight. You're holy. Do we work on holiness? Yes. We preach on holiness? Yes. But when Jesus died for you and you accepted that gift, you are looked at as holy, blameless, without blemish. It's like a grace filter went on your life, like Instagram. Like yours is like no blemish. It's gone. Check out this filter. The grace covers you and it says, and free from all accusation, you are blameless in Christ. This is hard to wrap my head around, y'all. You're telling me that what I did this week, if I belong to Christ, he still sees me blameless? Yes! Yes! And the fact that it's so quiet in here shows me you've been taught something your entire life differently. And I had too. And so I worked really hard to make sure I look good for God. So I wore my best clothes. I said my best words. I even went Shakespearean on that prayer. Did you hear that big word, Lord? I prayed for 30 minutes last night. It's not bad. It's just that when you're performing for a God who's already made you holy, he's like, what are you doing? You don't got to perform to get in my presence. I just want you here because you're my child. Nothing else. You're blameless. You're holy. If you're in Christ, if you don't belong to Christ, we can talk about that in a second, but if you're in Christ... There's no accusations against you. And what did Jesus say to this woman? He says, woman, where are your accusers at? Everyone there who was reminding of her sin were called accusers. Everything that's reminding you of your sin is called accusers. The consequence in your life is trying to be an accuser. It's accusing you. Every time you see the oatmeal ripped from the ceiling, it's accusing you of what you did years ago to keep you in the place that God's trying to free you from. Your consequences are accusing you. People are accusing you. They're reminding you of what you have done. But Jesus affirms you. Can I tell you this? <laughs> don't, we got to be very careful that we don't allow people who sin differently than us keep accusing us. When we have a Jesus who died for us, 
he should be the one who affirms us. Listen, I know it's real. I know people are reminding you of what you have done. And I'm not saying, please hear me, if you had to take responsibility for your actions, I am not saying you don't need to have a talk and say you're sorry. That's not this. Like, I don't have to go and say anything. Listen, I'm not saying, like, I don't know what. God, God doesn't condemn me. You need to accept me. No, they forgave you. They're just using wisdom right now. You hurt them. And you need to give them space to learn that trust. Listen, how do I say this? We don't put registered sex offenders in the kids' area to serve your kids. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> listen, listen, please hear me. Not because we're going to condemn them. Not because if they actually came to Christ and said, God, I want a new life, God forgives them. We are not condemning them, we're using wisdom. Okay? They're still welcome to come into spaces where they can grow and learn about Christ, but because of your sin, there are consequences that can remind you of that. I'm not saying these things, like, you should just have me. No, <laughs> you're not coming back here. There's wisdom involved. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is the people who continually remind you what you've done, who you were, how you acted, what you said. That's why they said love does not keep records of wrongs because love, once it forgives you, doesn't keep pulling back your trash to shame you, right? Marriage 101, I'm working on this. Stop bringing up what they did last year. It doesn't work. But what we can do is we can stop focusing on the accusations coming against us and we can focus on the affirmation that Jesus gives us. And listen, the only person who can tell you who you are are not the people who are accusing you. It's the one who died for you. He's the one that calls you blameless. He's the one that calls you a child of God. He's the one that calls you holy. If Jesus calls me holy, if he calls me blameless, if he calls me a child of God, then it doesn't matter what this world says. It matters what Jesus says. So if this consequence is accusing me, I'm going to affirm myself. So you can walk, I know it feels, I, I feel so dirty sometimes when I get angry and I lifted my voice up, I make responsibility, I go to my girls, I say, listen, I'm angry because you hit your sister. We should not hit our sister. The way I handled it was wrong. It is not your responsibility to manage daddy's anger. They need to know that. This is going you know, it's not your kid's responsibility to control your self-control. When you, you did this to me. No, you don't have a rein on your tongue. You did this to me. No, you need counseling. <laughs> Quit blaming your kids for your dysfunction because you're mad at your parents for doing it to you too. <laughs> Why did this turn into on grace? Anyways. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm angry. Anger is not a sin. But when it elevated to me raising my voice, I am sorry. I am wrong, Right? The eggshells created are the consequences that I may have created, and now I have to learn from that, not to shame them. Why are you walking on eggshells all the time? Well, I know why. Because for five years, I didn't let you make a decision. Why is it so hard for you to choose where you want to eat, babe? Because when I choose, you say, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> why can't you just make a decision, babe? Because when I make it, it's the wrong one. And now what I got to do is remind myself to give her space when she's making a decision. Hey, I remember in the past, there's been times I have not let you make a decision, and I'm working on that, but I really want to know what your decision is. And then she'd choose something gross. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> how's your food? Great. Good. I just love being with you, babe. <laughs> Why do I say this? I'm saying this because I want us to also take responsibility where we need to take the responsibility to, okay? So in those moments that I still get angry or I have a talk with Liz, I have to affirm myself in Christ. So what that means is it feels dirty. I take responsibility. I say sorry to Charlie or Avery or Millie or my wife, and I walk out, and I have to do this. And this sounds so crazy. Lord, thank you so much for forgiving me. Not, Lord, please forgive me. He's already forgiven me. He's already sees me blameless, but I'm going to, a, confession is, I see this. We need to confess still. I see, thank you for forgiving me. I should not be blameless right now. I feel so dirty, but for some reason, Lord, you still call me a child of God. So I'm going to live like a child of God. Not because I deserve it, but because you said I could. Did you hear me? Feels uncomfortable because you're like, but look at what I just did. I get it. But this is what's going to free you to be better. From experience. The last thing is this. 
God can still use consequences. God can still use consequences. I don't know what it is, but my, one of my daughters is like an Olympic athlete in breaking things. Like if there was an Olympic like sport, if there was like a Twitch channel, she'd be making millions of dollars on this. I'd like keep breaking things. But she's just really good at breaking things, not really on purpose, just breaking them. Um, and so a lot of times she breaks them like that's too far broken. Don't worry. Don't, don't even do it. And so she'll go, call Gramps. I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, it, it's just too broken. Call Gramps. So she will literally take things to my grandparents' house and give it to Gramps because he fixes everything. <laughs> like literally, like everything she's broken, I'm like, nah, it's not going to be fixed. He, he fixes it. He finds a way to fix it. I think he goes and buys a new one and brings it back, <laughs> but whatever. He's like, here it is. I'm like, okay. No, I'm, I'm grateful for amazing grandparents. But it's funny because she's like, call Gramps. Every time she breaks something, she knows if she can get it into Gramps' hands, he's going to figure out how to fix this thing or how to make it look better or even sometimes better than what it looked like before. She knows that when something is broken, I can put it in Gramps' hands, and it's going to be okay. I wonder if we could do the same thing with our consequences. I wonder if we realize that we could take our broken marriages, our broken attitudes, our broken minds, our broken habits, our broken lives, and say, you know what? This looks broken, and if we can just get them in the Father's hands, he can somehow make this thing work. He can still work in my broken areas. Y'all... Grace is so much better than just stopping us. It helps. It takes the consequences of our reactions. He goes, I'll use that too. He's like, I'll forgive you. Give me the broken stuff. I'll figure out how to use that too. That's how good he is. Don't, okay, Romans 8, 28, since you don't believe me. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And God causes what? Everything. That includes our consequences. Some of you are like, I just got to accept. I'm going to live in this consequence the rest of my life. And maybe you do. But sometimes God can supernaturally do things that are above our even mindsets. And we got to live in a place of faith, believing I may not have to live in this consequence for the rest of my life. Or, you know what? If I'm going to live in this consequence, then I'm going to give it to God and watch him make the devil pay for everything he tried taking from me. You got to live that way. And that's, oh, well, I'm just going to accept it. Almighty consequence. No, 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 no. God can use everything everything to work together for the, if we could just treat our broken areas like charlie treats something when she breaks you see one of the things that she breaks a lot were crayons growing up she always broke crayons and uh i don't know why i think she colors the same way i put dishes away in the sink <laughs> and so And uh, I'm working on my stand-up. I'm going to see a stand-up tonight, actually, with my wife. I'm really excited. And, um, and she'll break a crayon, and she would start throwing a fit. She would kick, and she would scream, and she'd throw it at the garbage can. And she goes, ah! Daddy, I broke another one. And, that, just, <coughs> and she was pushing too hard. And I remember saying, baby, it's okay. Calm down. And I would get on my knee, and I would take that, right? I would take that crayon. I was like, listen, listen. You can still use it. And I would take the paper and I would start tearing it off of the broken crayon, which she couldn't get. And I would take all that paper off and I would go down and I would start drawing on there. You could see her face. <gasps> and I was like, I know. Broken crayon still color. They still color. Some of you have given up because there's so much brokenness in your life. And God says, Broken grand still color. Broken places still color. I know you thought you ruined this thing once and for all, but if you put it in my hands, I'll show you I can still paint something beautiful. I can still make this thing work. I can take your past shame, and I can draw something beautiful for your future. I'm telling you, God, so you feel like you're too big of a sinner. You feel like you've messed up too big. Listen, your sin may be great, but our Savior is way greater. And I tr I, I, I'm telling you, if you can just accept his grace today and you say, you know what, it hurts and it's painful and it feels broken, and I'm just going to say, God, use it. I know I made these choices, but God, use it. He has such a way of saying, hey, broken things still color. I can still use you. I can still use the consequence. I can still use your marriage. I can still use this. Just receive my grace. I can do it. Lord, we thank you so much for this word.
Thank you, Father God, for reminding us that in our consequences, Lord, you can still use us. I know a lot of times people don't know how to sit in this moment because they may feel like this is a fluff message because it reminds them that God is so good. And even though I have sin in my life and all these things, we need to address the sin. But, Lord, we did address it the way you did. You addressed it with grace. That's how you addressed our sin. You sent your son to die for us. You said, I see sin in your life. So I'm sending a Savior to eradicate that sin. And so, Lord, I pray for every person who is weighed down by their consequence. I pray this would be the freeing message that would dissipate the black cloud in their life. Maybe they feel like the marriage is now gone, and no matter what they do moving forward, it doesn't matter. But I just pray right now that they would see that if they could just give you this broken area of their life, that you can still color something beautiful. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a record on their name. Maybe it's an addiction they're overcoming. Maybe they just got out of jail, or maybe they're watching from online in jail. Lord, that this is an area that you can take and you can still color. I've seen it time and time again. So, Lord, I just pray that you would help us be encouraged today to learn from these things. We're so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. With eyes closed, I do want to give someone an opportunity to make their decision to follow Jesus today. Because earlier I said, this is the truth for those who belong in Christ, where there is no condemnation. God is sees you as holy, blameless, covered by his sacrifice on the cross. But if you're not in Christ, if you have not put your faith in Christ, you are still separated. He does not see you blameless. The harsh reality is he sees you as an enemy. Not because he wants to be your enemy, but because we have chose to be the enemy. So if you want to go from an enemy towards God to a child of God, all you got to do is put your trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, that he died and he rose again. And there's some people in this room that need to make that decision. Maybe you're online, you need to make that decision. Like, Sean, how do I make that decision? You're going to pray this prayer with me by faith. You're going to say these words by faith in your heart, and you're going to mean it as you focus on Christ. Church, could you help me say these words with those who might say it for the first time? Repeat these after me if you want to start a brand new relationship with Christ. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I sinned and you died for it. You paid my debt. I want to be blameless. I want to be holy. And I cannot do that without your grace. So I choose you today. Take my past, take my broken pieces, and make something beautiful out of them. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. With eyes remaining closed right there, if you prayed that prayer, you made the best decision of your entire life. You have now gone from an enemy of God to a child of God. You are in darkness, and now you're in his wonderful light. You are blameless and holy. There is now no condemnation. He has forgiven you past, present, and future. That's something that's to be excited about. If you're here and you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something bold just right where you are. You don't have to move or go anywhere. I just want you to lift up your hand so we can just celebrate you right now. With eyes closed, if that was you. I have a bag. I want to put that hand up. Amen. Amen. Put that hand up. Say, that was me. Put that I have a gift for you that's coming. If you have your hand up, don't be startled by it. It's just going to help you with your decision. Put that hand up higher. I see you. I see you. They're coming. Praise God. No matter how old, no age. Praise God. If you're online, there's a link you can click that says, I decide to follow Jesus. This is why we started the church, so that people can make decisions to follow Christ. Lord, thank you so much for those hands that went up. I pray right now that they would realize that they are loved and that your grace has covered all of their sin, past, present, and future, that they are a child of God. So grateful for you and what you're doing in this series, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's celebrate everyone who took that next step. Come on, guys. Yeah.